Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Making Action Happen. I'm Sarah Blackhurst. And I'm Brian McCain. And we also have our, you, you qualify as like our third host now, right? I know, exactly. Oh. Love Beat is my second home, Pueblo, Colorado. Yeah. I think yeah. the only one that has more episodes with us than you is maybe Mike Beasley. Yeah. Well, I think John McCain was on Meet the Press like 64 times or something. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. We'll see who I can get on that record. Oh, yeah. Let's work on that It's just great to be here. It's um, Adam Frisch is back with us today. Of course, you're doing a 27 county tour right now that you're in the middle of. Uh, and what I love about it is that you don't actually have to do this right now. You're not being primaried. It's going really smoothly, but that's just the kind of guy you are in the campaign you're running. So tell us about what you're figuring out and learning that you didn't know before. Well, uh, I was listening and learning. Yeah, we have some caucuses and assemblies. I'm not even sure actually um, how they work or what they are. I just know that this is how we officially get on the ballot, and we're running uncontested, um, and so we're doing it. But again, let's remind ourselves, 27 counties, uh, 50% of the geography of Colorado, 10 hours to drive from La Junta all the way up to past Dinosaur, North West Colorado. With good weather. With good weather. Yeah. yeah. We never have traffic, but it's always it's, weather dependent. Yeah, it's the weather. Um, my son, Felix, behind the camera now is on spring break. Uh, mm. Some of you might have met him out there. He did his junior of high school online last year, and we had a 25,000-mile father-son road trip last year just driving just around. Doing and so uh, we were at the Pueblo Firefighters uh, Ball dinner at the convention center here on Saturday. Oh, we yeah. ended up... Uh, the next morning, we were in Swatch, and we ended up in Creed, Lake City, um, Pagosa Springs. Isn't it the greatest yeah. area? I yeah. love it. Spent the night so in a, uh, um, Antonito the other night, and just, you know, the district is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, um, Brian knows it well, but it's definitely the prettiest district in the entire country. Um, I, I actually very much agree with you on that. So um, for those of you who aren't listening, the San Luis Valley, we think about it being really kind of small, but it's actually quite big. Yeah. It's geographically, it's huge. Yeah. So when you're talking Mineral County down to Castilla County, it takes a good, like if you're driving to, from Mineral to Castilla County, that's what? Five, probably five hours. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, without the snowstorm that we got into a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah, it's about five hours, and it's been – it's great. I mean, we can talk more policy than politics, but I was, the common theme um, from our most conservative – you know, we have some – we have 85% Republican counties and 85% right. right. Democratic counties. We have some of the wealthiest counties in the country, and we have some of the least well-off that are still struggling. Uh, Felix and I were in San Luis the other day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, talking with 10 or 15 people around the table at Piccadilly Circus Pizza. I want oh, yep. to make a big mm -hmm. pitch yep. for that. You know, but, you know, it, it's heartbreaking to um, meet a 10-year a veteran uh, school teacher that's making twenty three, twenty four thousand dollars $24,000. Oh, my gosh, I know. I know. And the school district down there, um, uh, Toby, the superintendent works so hard. Yeah, and everybody. He has mm -hmm. to do. he has to do all of these grants just to keep everything going. Yeah. And then they have to work together in a way, and they do more with less. It's, it's, it, is, it is heartbreaking how hard they have to work just to live there. And they're all volunteering at the different around the community. Oh, yeah. and, but, you know, the, 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 we, there was a, a seventh grader there that plays Lake City Creed in basketball. Mm -hmm. And so there's your four-and-a-half-hour one-way drive to oh, just get gosh, some hoops yeah. in. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. I was going to throw a joke in there. The the valley is so big, that's why they have the secret bases there for all the aliens. That's right. <laughs> exactly. All the helicopters and, and stuff. stuff. There's more really great stories that come out of the valley than just about any place else in Colorado. Like anywhere. Any, yeah. Anywhere. In the, right? Anywhere. Yeah. So something really, you sent me a text. I think it was Saturday morning. It might have been Friday, but I think it was Saturday. Something really big happened this week. Um, from a federal level, and that is De, uh, DeGette's um, atomic energy bill. Let talk, can we talk about yeah, that? Yeah, this is yeah, really sure. cool. So uh, Diana DeGette's our uh, congresswoman, 10 or 11 terms up in central Denver. Yeah. And she has been working on this bill uh, to work with the Department of Energy, even the Biden administration, is supportive of the nuclear energy being part of this uh, next generation conversation. Uh, you know, you have a base load. There aren't that many places that you can produce base load energy, which is 24 seven right. uh, that doesn't have carbon and geothermal is one. And so is the nuclear conversation, mm -hmm. which I appreciate it's a hot topic down here, it is. but um, the, the house of representatives in the midst of all this conversation, I think they voted 300 or no, 
365 to 35. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm not sure they could get that many votes to agree that there's seven days in a week. I know. Um, and, and, and the entire um, Colorado delegation voted for it, except for Lamborn. Yeah. Because he wasn't president. He was, he was a president. Yeah. So it was, it was 7-0 in that. Yeah. You know, I, I think there are some hopes out there, given that, you know, if you want to work on true climate crisis and you want to, want to make sure you protect our national security and you want to have a really important job about the economics of energy, not just how much energy costs – and how reliable it is, but the jobs and wages that come from that, you have to make sure that nuclear is part of that discussion. Mm -hmm. It might not be right for everybody, having said that. But again, if we're truly trying to figure out how to produce energy in our country, um, you know, the two best places probably in the world are California and Colorado, given our regulatory environment. Right. And the private energy sector uh, companies in Colorado, a lot of them are in CD3 as well, not just up in North mm -hmm. northeast Colorado, is that they've been able to produce energy, make some type of profit, pay a lot of people well, and still follow the regulations um, currently. But it's starting to get to be a bit of a pinch point. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to happen in Colorado what happened in California, which basically they've gotten out of almost all the entire – um, domestic energy production in California. And last I read, I think like 15% of the gasoline that's pumped out of a California gas, um, gas pump is coming from the Amazon rainforest. <gasps> like, and I'm not sure how gasoline or oil or, or is made out of the Amazon rainforest, but I can't imagine it's not completely oh worse off for yeah. labor laws and environmental laws and what's going on in California. And people get upset about it when I mention it, but like, I feel like Colorado, we're kind of stuck in like we're exporting our guilt mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how to try to do the right thing. That's a great way to say it. And um, I just want to make sure that we're not chasing out of hardworking domestic energy producers in Colorado, especially in the Western Slope and a little bit in s Southern Colorado. And having that energy production is going to Wyoming or Utah, which I all love, but I'm certainly positive that those – regulations in those states aren't what they are in Colorado, yeah. let alone asking Qatar or Russia to produce natural gas or China to produce more oil or Venezuela or Iran to produce more um, oil, sorry, or, or China to produce more coal. Yeah, and it's – so this is a very passionate, heated subject here in Pueblo, obviously. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, but what, you know, I'm, I'm coming from it um, from a neutral standpoint – and I did speak with somebody that was kind of the head of the anti-nuclear movement in Pueblo who's no longer there. And they mentioned that, you know, technologies has changed and that they would like to see discussion on it. And I think right now is the prime time and, and you're, we're seeing both sides come up, you know, the, you know, everything nuclear to no nuclear. But I think right now what we need to focus on and what Pueblo does, and I think Pueblo wants it too, that the, based on the survey that the PISAC did, um, you know, we need to have this discussion. It has to be in the discussion. And there are resources out there, and we're working with the Department of Energy, and you met who we were talking about earlier, and I, I think they're going to come on the podcast in two weeks to have a nonpartisan, non-biased discussion on what nuclear means for Pueblo and what it really is. Because you ask the average person here in Pueblo, and they, don't, they say, like, well, I don't want nuclear waste, and I don't want these giant nuclear towers. And what they're talking about is not that. It's like the size of a Walmart parking lot basically. Yeah. And, and it's not like the Simpsons. You know, everybody thinks yeah. the Simpsons when you think nuclear. So I think right now we, with this bill, that's maybe that will bring some political points into the conversation from a political side that has traditionally been anti-nuclear to have the discussion and say, Hey, let's talk about this yeah. and see what public wants. And at the end of the day, it's up to the community more than anything. Yeah. And I would say that exact same thing when I'm sitting in Congress, I'm not going to try to stuff a nuclear power plant uh, on any community. Um, but the fact that you have more than 360 or some bipartisan, by definition, supporters of it, it needs to be at the conversation with sincerity and authenticity to have these conversations. And I just don't know how you don't do that. You know, at the end of the day, everyone, a lot of people around the country are watching this Terra Power company work on a, a small modular reactor up in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And there's a coal plant that's winding down. And the idea is that the coal plant goes away and you bring in the nuclear um, facility and you plug it into the transmission lines that are already there right? and you get going. Now, my understanding would be that there's going to be enough demand from communities that are 90% in that are probably going to be able to take the next generation when they first come out. And 
uh, you know, from spending time in Rio Blanco and Mafe, Craig, right. with those three coal plants coming offline as well over the next, you know, five, eight years, mm-hmm. um, there seems to be a lot of excitement about that. I, I appreciate Pueblo's always a little bit more complicated down here, <laughs> and I'm, I just hopefully they, they can have thoughtful, calm conversations from an economic standpoint and a global climate standpoint and a national security standpoint about right. more domestic energy is just better for the world and it's better for us and it's better for our, our, our allies. So I'm curious, We um, I just literally came in from um, Denver. I was at the Capitol with um, the Pueblo Manufacturers. Um, there's a Pueblo Manufacturers group, and they were concerned about a couple of bills. But when we were meeting with the Colorado um, Chamber, they are um, sort of labeling, for lack of a better way to say it, um, these bill. a lot of the bills that are happening right now or that have been introduced or being introduced, and there's, it feels like there's a new one every day, um, and they're calling them the the job killer bills. Um, have you is since you've been out there in a lot of other places, and it's it's hard during the session for me to travel a bunch. But um, are they? Are, do you think that um, Coloradans and CD three are are aware that these bills are happening and and kind of what the impact is on them? Because um, that was one of the concerns that got brought up today was that do do Coloradans really know what's going on up at the Capitol? Um, right now, and are they concerned? I think people are concerned whether they know what's going on up there or mm-hmm. not. I mean, listen, there's a conversation about the global climate crisis. There's a conversation about the democracy on the presidential race, which I don't want to get involved in, but I'm telling you, the vast majority of people are just trying to keep their heads above water financially, child care, health care, mm-hmm. getting their jobs, trying to save a little bit of money and, and be able to breathe a little bit on the weekends here and there. And uh, I think we were up in Rural Voices of Colorado a couple weeks ago with, yeah. uh, you know, it was a combination of Club 20 and Pro 15 out in the Eastern right. Plains. And you guys a little bit, right? And I think the stats were like Colorado used to be like number five in uh, best places to produce entrepreneurship, new jobs. And now I think we've fallen to somewhere in the 40s. Oh, my goodness. And, um, you know, we all need some type of regulations and we want to make sure workers are protected. But we need to have a balance to make sure that actually you're not chasing jobs away. And, uh, you know, the joke is we don't want Colorado to be Eastern California and how hard it is to make jobs and produce jobs. And people want a paycheck and they deserve a paycheck and they want to work really, really hard. And so I think that is what's happening. So I'm not exactly focused on the state capital bills. I know there's a lot of them. And I just think that, um, you know, I want to focus on what's going on in D.C. a little bit. But I do pay attention to that because it comes up a lot. Yeah. And people do do know the difference between what's going on at the state capitol and what's happening in D.C., but it's the overall vibe. And something I shared with you before, which you mentioned, is, you know, we have 64 counties in the country, and I would say like 10 or 11 of them are kind of the consuming type of yes, counties, right? We have Thank these you. I love eight metro areas. This. I put Boulder in that. I put my, my county I live in now, Picking County, Aspen, San Miguel, and Telluride. And, you know, the... A lot of that is on the consuming side or in the services industry, finance and banking and insurance and consulting. But there's 50-some counties in our state, a lot of them in CD3, that are producing. Mm -hmm. Producing water, if you will, producing energy, Mm -hmm. producing farm uh, goods, producing agriculture, producing steel, Mm -hmm. producing wind turbine towers. Um, And there's just a disconnect between the consuming people making the laws for the people that are actually producing the stuff that everybody uses. And that disconnect, it might be just a different version of rural versus urban, but I think it kind of gets to the more heart of people that are actually producing things and people that are more from a consuming side and that disconnect between how hard it is to go to work and produce something that people need and want. So we had had Russ in and we had Jeff. Yep. And, um, you know, it was right after uh, Congressman Bober dropped out. And one question I asked them is, uh, what has changed? Has your message changed? Uh, what you're doing, have you changed it up a little bit? Or, and surprisingly, you know, I, I would think, you know, as the strategist in me, I'm like, oh, yeah, now I'm going to concentrate on this and stuff. And they do have a very heated primary with this. Yeah, But they, they said, no, we're just doing what we're doing. And we're keeping the message the same because it's the right message. How do you feel about it? Yeah, you know, I got in February of 22, and, you know, there were some comments made by the current congresswoman, and they got me thinking uh, about is there a better way forward to have someone focus on the job and not themselves as much, and I'll just kind of leave it at that. But we started just driving around, and we've been trying to tell people why people should be voting for us, Mm -hmm. uh, not against someone else. 
And a lot of that got lost in the shuffle because, um, for better or worse, um, she created a lot of national attention and a lot of other people were in here. Um, some people kind of trying to help us but not really helping us because they were picking on her for things that should not be part of the conversation, mm-hmm. kids and family, which we never, ever got into. Right. Uh, and so one of the upsides about her moving to the Eastern Slope or the Eastern Plains is that there's just more space for me to be able to tell people why they should be voting for us and not Mm -hmm. against someone else. And as I tell people from day one, it's not team red or team blue, it's team CD three. And I remain very, very focused on that and finding people are just desperate for true leadership and seriousness and trying to, and the competency stuff and knowing that when it comes to energy, when it comes to natural resources, when it comes to protecting our environment, when it comes to jobs, when it comes to water, um, there's a lot of things that are more focused in competency than it is about the kind of the flame throwing on the far left or the far right. And they're looking for someone to focus on and get on the committees that matter um, to to the district, not to their own self or their ways that they're going to get more Twitter and more cable news network coverage. And so that's kind of what I've been focusing on for the whole time. And so the fact that she's somewhere else uh, – allows for a better conversation in my mind, and I'm looking forward to those conversations, whoever I end up running alongside or against in the fall or in the summer and the fall. So in this last little um, bit, and how long have you been, uh, you were doing a 27-county tour. Um, I don't know how far you are into that. Yeah, we're, we have about six or seven counties left. We're heading uh, to Bogosa Springs tonight. Uh, okay. We have a little bit of a gathering in Pueblo, and then we have about a four-hour drive over to Bogosa, and we're going to be going down to Cortez, uh, stop in, in San Juan County through um, Ure, and then up to you know Montrose, Delta. Uh, we have some time in Durango, and we'll finish up in Grand Junction on Saturday. And, you know, I've been on the road about 24, 25 days a month for literally two years. Yeah. Um, and it's just, you know, I was, I'll be home after this trip for about nine or 10 days. And I think it'll be the longest I'll be home in, in two years. And so I don't know, like my, uh, Felix encouraged me to run. My wife, Katie encouraged me to run. Every time I come home, the bags were already packed up me for the next trip. So, uh, I'm not sure what kind of message that comes from Katie. No, she's been fantastic uh, as far as, uh, making sure that we stay grounded, working, uh, being, you know, we, we shared duty, uh, for sure. Cause she, runs her family manufacturing business. Mm-hmm. So when, before I got into this, I was doing a lot of the, the stuff at home, raising raising the kids and making breakfasts and lunches and everything else like that and doing some volunteer work after my city council time. And now she's taking the brunt of, of, of the family and the house stuff. And so I need to take hats off to that. But it's great to have Felix on the road Big time. Um, for this time. And so, yeah, we have a six or seven more counties, and we're excited to get back home for a little bit. So uh, what – because this is interesting. You've been campaigning for over two years nonstop. So how how do you feel you've changed from the beginning to now? And and I could point some things out. And they're not <laughs> criticisms, but just, you know, I, I think that your speaking and knowledge of some of the stuff is like increased exponentially. Yeah, of course. Sure, you, know, sure. you learn as oh, you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But how do you feel you've changed over that? Because that's a long time to be campaigning. Well, I, I went up 20 pounds and down about 18 pounds. So that's one thing that's changed. Um, you know, listen, obviously, I, th- I think that I've always had ideas in my head that I'm a policy focused person and want to take the job seriously. And I've had that. Um, and I knew some of the conversations about water and natural resources and energy. But certainly learned a lot, including my very first time on here talking about prior preparations and those kind of Mm -hmm. conversations. And so like anything, whether you're playing t-ball or running for office, uh, the time on task is helpful. I will say there's a lot of hard things about running, especially in a district that's so big and we got dragged through the mud a lot last year. But we don't need to go that way thinking forward. But the easy thing for me from day one is that what I share here is what I share in our more liberal communities. Uh, and what I've talked about in the Democratic primary, the same thing I talked about in the general, and the same thing I had conversations with Katie and Felix and Quintessa. So I'm just sharing what I'm, I believe, and I'm learning always from this kind of stuff. But the, the core message of how important um, the rural parts of Colorado and the country are remain really, really important to me. And so I continue to learn a lot and continue to drive around a lot. So you know, we we wrapped up our election November of 22, and we had about a month off before people started saying, like, you should really think about going again. And then we ended up launching again. And so we're fortunate, 
you know, I, I need a job. So um, that's not why I'm running for this job. But God forbid this doesn't work out. Well, I'll, I'll need to go back to work, whatever. But we're fortunate that we have the time to put into it from a family standpoint to be able to drive around. But that's what needs to be done in a district that's bigger than the mm-hmm. state of Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And just being on the road and earning the trust of a lot of people. And we have done that. And we will continue to work really, really hard. But, yeah, Brian, I mean, I think it's fair to say, you know, I knew what I was doing before, but certainly having more time on the road, mm-hmm. getting in front of more people. And as I tell people, like, I'm burdened with facts. <laughs> yeah. And mm-hmm. so when I stand up in front of people, um, talking about domestic energy is something that's really important, mm-hmm. even in some of our more liberal counties. I will tell you, a lot of people understand it when I what's kind of brought that way to them. Um, but, you know, after that, some people think I'm either – dumb or brave or maybe a little bit of both <laughs> for either running or be speaking what I'm speaking about. And, um, you know, I, I've made it very clear to the team it's going to be a, a candidate-led conversation, not a consultant-led conversation. You realize a lot of these people running for Congress around the country, they're actually kind of picked out by a party mm-hmm. and brought into the conversation and say, this is what you're going to do. 35 hours a week, you're going to sit in a room and make phone calls and ask for money. And the other 20 hours a week, we'll tell you what to say, and you go around and say it. Mm-hmm. Oh my and I'm like flabbergasted that that is, or naive, that that is how a lot of people work. But you see these five Democrats in Trump districts, and you see a dozen or more Republicans in Biden districts. And the way that, that those 20 people have been able to build trust across party lines is because they're sincerely believing in what they're saying, and they're focused on their district, not on the party. And that's how we've been from day one. And that certainly has not changed, nor will change. And that's that's what, why I, I think you're interesting. This is what interests me because I've seen that before, and I, I know what it takes to run, and I know how that works. And you haven't bought into that at all. Yeah. Like, like honestly, I could say that, like, knowing you personally, you have not bought into the model of how you should be running right now. And, and I think that's a good thing, and it has to be that way here. And I yeah. appreciate that. But you're, uh, unfortunately, an outlier right now because I know other people, we know other people that are running, um, I won't say the races, because it, it, and that's, I mean, it's like the consultant candidacy, yeah. you know. I, I would, I will tell you, um, you know, I, I've never given the same speech twice to the mm-hmm. shrugging of maybe my uh, my staff. I don't have any written notes. I don't have a speech. I just get up and start talking. And yeah. so I try to hit some of the same themes. But it's never um, as organized maybe as it should be. But with that comes authenticity and sincerity. Mm-hmm. And I think people do see that in me, that I truly believe in what I'm saying. And I'm, an, I'm truly a nice guy. And I think getting out there and when you offer that authenticity and sincerity, unfortunately, it's very rare on either side, mm-hmm. right? Um, but it allows you to earn trust with some people that you might not agree with mm-hmm. me on every single issue, but you know at the end of the day, I really, really care about CD3, and I really, really care about Colorado, and I really, really care about our nation. So I have two questions for you, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, one is uh, you've got to hear a lot of stories. People have to come to you with their personal stories um, all the, like all the time. What's one story that you're going to keep? That's like You're like, this is, this is going to stick with me. Uh, a little bit on a bummer note and then a more of a positive note. The bummer note, I was just, um, we did a little gathering down at Bistoro last night and oh, there was a, a, a woman about my age that uh, said that she had just lost her uh, sister to fentanyl and it was a single pill that she bought for a dollar um, and thought she was taking um, a, a normal painkiller. Yeah. And so I think the message for all of us is just make sure that you know what you're taking, yeah. even when you think oh you're gosh. taking stuff. And that is just, you know, these horror stories are everywhere. And so that's something that, that will, you know, it's 24 hours old, but it's something that's going to remain positive. I guess the other thing was when I was in San Luis talking to some of these people, that you know, there are people that uh, I met a couple that um, grew up in the South, were living elsewhere in Colorado and decided to move down to uh, San Luis because of the beauty and the cost of living and they're on land and they're raising a couple of kids and they're, they're the, a, a teacher at the school and they're still f- finding time to volunteer and do coaching. And, you know, there's just a lot, a lot of great people. And I will tell you 80% of the people agree on 80% of the stuff. I don't care where you are in the country. I can vouch after a 48,000 mile focus group. <laughs> and the problem is, is anger tainment of social media and television. They make all their money on finding where we disagree a little bit, somewhat civilly, and just figure out how to jack the heck out of it. And that's how they make their ratings and their money. And we all just need to kind of raise our bar, take a deep breath, and try to focus on where we can have, I say, 
common ground and go from there because there's a lot more common ground no matter what people say mm-hmm. or how many people are yelling. There's a lot more common ground in this district than I think a lot of people realize. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Totally agree. And, and politically, you could see it too because, and we've talked about this, it's switched. You go from Republican to Democrat. It's always back and forth. Yeah. And, it, and I think that's because there is that common ground. Yeah. And the candidates mostly have been good candidates to represent that in the yeah. district. I mean, there's a lot of conservative Democrats, including in public county for mm-hmm. sure and obviously a lot of you know a lot of our conservative uh friends it's more of a libertarian conversation they mm-hmm. want to be left mm-hmm. alone about they don't want to get involved in who you want to marry and who you want to love and everything else like that you know and i think that's a big pushback they're just seeing from dc and from denver a lot of um kind of interruption and regulation coming on them when they still seem to be hey i'm just trying to raise some cattle yeah. and i'm just trying to grow uh you know so, some food uh and i'm just a potato farmer and why do they want all this and that and that yeah. when i'm just trying to do the right thing and feed the feed the state feed the feed the country right um and i think that pushback and the lack of humility that comes from kind of the urban areas of our state capitals and national capitals are are, are getting to be overreach of an epic proportion that's a great way to say it. Okay, so this is last question, and it's a super important one because it's going to tell everybody really about who you are and and what you stand for. You're heading chocolate down- chip ice cream. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> you're heading down to Pagosa Springs in Durango. At what point in that road trip do you start listening to C.W. McCall? Uh, probably within about 30 seconds, especially if Felix has the, uh, has the <laughs> radio station. So, you know, there's a lot of great music out there that's very appropriate for CD3. But yeah, you've got it. But there's a certain point in that drive that you have to start listening to CW McCall and you know right where you do you start that every time. So, um, well, Adam, thank you so much for staying or for meeting with us and if somebody wants to know more about you where do they go oh thanks yeah adam for colorado.com adam for colorado.com love to see you on the website um and do you have uh, where your stops are on the website so they if people it's, want to yeah it's on the website as well as on our facebook page and you know social media you know unlike a lot of other candidates that run around and have closed meetings or skip out of um types of um candidate forms you know i, I show up yeah, um, yeah, I, do. I mean, we were in, we were just in Grand Junction a couple of weeks ago in front of ninety people, and yeah. you know there were MAGA hats to um, different type of hats as well. And I I just take a mic and answer questions for an hour and drink a couple of beers. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, so disclaimer. Yes. <coughs> Here you go. Two uh, more shows. Well, there, the yeah, there's. Uh, yeah. Um, It's different. The words are different now. So making action happen does not support or endorse candidates. What we do is support the members of Action Colorado. Um, If you're uh, running for office, doesn't matter how high or how low it is, and it's never low. Everybody says a dog catcher, but they make good money, and that's an elected position. But this is your opportunity to come on Making Action Happen. Go to Action Colorado to find out how to become a member or makingactionhappen.com to listen to the latest episode and also email me at brian at action colorado or brian at making action happen.com chad vorthman i know you're listening i hope i get a phone call in the next um, 10 or 20 minutes uh from hearing this that tells me when you start listening to cw mccall on your road trips we'll see you guys next time thanks thanks everybody